Hi guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Gigabyte MZ92-FS0 dual epic server motherboard that Wendell from Level 1 Text brought in. And uh, yeah, so this is like a three-way collab at this point, because, you know, I run AHOC, I'm doing this for Gamers Nexus, and Wendell from Level 1 Techs brought this in. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair Virtuoso RGB wireless gaming headset. The Corsair Virtuoso headset is comfort-focused with a set of memory foam ear pads, headband, and lightweight construction. The Virtuoso wireless headphones use 50 millimeter drivers that range from 20 hertz to 40 kilohertz, with a wireless connection that ranges up to 60 feet. Corsair also includes a detachable, high-quality microphone for voice comms. Learn more at the link in the description below. Yeah, I don't normally look at server hardware, and I've been and I've had people request that I look at server hardware on multiple occasions, and I've just not done it because I find server hardware extremely boring. That was at least until I saw, you know, the most recent video about this uh, lovely server right here, and I heard that apparently these things are overclockable, but apparently you also don't want to push them very much, and and yeah, I, I can't I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to push them very much. So the the thing is is I don't normally cover ser so the first thing is like I don't normally cover server hardware because it's not generally it hasn't been overclockable, um, and that basically means it's like compared to like consumer hardware you don't get the you don't get the variety you don't get the really like you don't get the ridiculous high end where everything is just built to well like a rid overbuilt to an absolutely ridiculous level right and you also don't get the bottom of the barrel trash because if you you know if you're you're a server ma manufacturer uh, you get a reputation for making servers that randomly up and die, well, you're not going to be staying in business for very long. So nobody really goes and makes like, well, no, you could make cut down motherboards where it's like th th this motherboard is just like not acceptable for these kinds of uh, workloads. But it's like you're going to have a spec sheet that very specifically says like we do not support CPUs with TDPs above X or whatever, right? You wouldn't go and have a, a motherboard where it's like, oh yeah, this has support for some crazy 64 core CPU with the power delivery only capable of powering like a 16 core. Like you wouldn't do that because it's bad for business. Um, and consumer land, you basically have uh, customers that vary from no money and no knowledge to uh, tons of money and still no knowledge. So that's why you get the sort of, you know, variety in, in, in consumer motherboards where you get the really cheap garbage motherboards where it's like the packaging cost is too high for those. Um, and then you also get the motherboards that are completely insanely overbuilt and also ridiculously expensive with things like unnecessary water blocks, RGB everywhere, plastic covers because you know, like, like, doesn't add any functionality to the motherboard. If anything, it probably makes the thermals of the motherboard worse, but consumers like aesthetics, and therefore we need more plastic on our motherboards. Um, and so, you know, that that's kind of the ridiculous high end where it's just like, well, the cost doesn't matter, but there's also like, at some point you just run out of things to put on the bloody board. So like, how do you justify that the board is $700 or $500 or some insane price tag? And... Yeah, you don't get that in server server space because you can't overclock. Um, nobody cares what the motherboard looks like. RGB is not like not a thing. Right? <laughs> like, okay. um, so instead, you get motherboards that are built very much to like this is the specification, and the motherboard will not go above. Like it is not capable of running significantly above spec, and it's definitely you know, and it's not going to be built below spec because it has to run at spec and it has to last however long the warranty is and, and that's that right like um you know you're, you're not gonna see uh you're not gonna see like the the motherboards where it's just like the, the cutting out every little piece of cost available where it's you know stripped down to the absolute bare minimum where it's just like yeah if you remove one more component from this it's not going to work anymore and you're not going to see motherboards where it's like you could disable half the vrm and it's still going to run like still going to be more than enough vrm for the cpu that it's supposed to power which is pretty normal on the ultra high end of consumer hardware like you can literally like there are motherboards <laughs> where if the vrm explodes you can literally repair them by just desoldering the like desoldering uh, the you know, damaged components, 
uh, isolating the short and the board will still run fine because the VRM is just so ridiculously overbuilt that it's just like, yeah, one or two, maybe even three phases missing, not a big deal, right? It had too many to start with. Um, yeah, you don't get that in servers. So let's start taking a look at this thing, starting off with the vCore VRMs. And I say vCore VRMs because dual socket means that everything is, well, so like everything is doubled, right? Each socket gets its own set of everything. So this is the vCore for, you know, this socket right here, right? Um, and then we have this vCore VRM over here as well. And, uh, the controller for both of these is unfortunately not visible on the side of the board and they didn't want to, you know, fully tear this server down to the point where it wasn't inside the case anymore. Um, but I'm going to make an educated guess that the controller used on this thing is an IR35201 because uh, the SOC VRM is handled by the IR35204. And the best way to describe the 35204 is it's the little brother of the IR35201. The 35204 is what you use when you don't need eight phases or more than five phases because the 35204 goes up to a four plus one configuration. Maybe just four phases. Nah, I think it's a four plus one. Um, anyway, 35201 goes all the way up to eight phases, but that's too many phases for a server motherboard. Seriously, this is a six. So this is running as a six plus zero, uh, assuming that, like, I'm assuming it's running as a six plus zero. I'm probably not wrong about that. Um, so yeah, we have a six phase here where it's just one, two, three, four, four, five. Bleh, that's not a five. Uh, six phases. And the power stages are just IR3555s. And no, there's no VRM heat sinks here because uh, these fans right here are very, very special fans. So here, here's a close up of one. Um, this is, so this is Delta. Um, they make, especially like they make server power supplies, server fans, um, and uh, well, they're, they're famous for making insane fans, especially. Uh, these right here, th this lovely PFM0812HE01, um, is an 80 by 80 by 38 millimeter fan. So it's thicker than your normal fan size. And it goes up to 16.3 thousand RPM. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, when, when so so to give you an idea of just how ridiculously fast this is, if you had a HD7970 or like a GTX 480 or a GTX 580 blower card or a uh, or a Vega 56 or a Vega 64 with the blower heatsink, right? Any or an R9290X with a blower heatsink, those heatsinks with the like GPUs with blowers normally have a fan RPM limit of 4,000 to 6.5 thousand RPM. Yeah, this is 16.3K. Um, this is like, this is anywhere from four to three times more RPM than what you normally find like on the like that the 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 fan on your GPU is actually probably the fastest fan in your entire system. Like if you have a blower card, it's pretty much the fastest fan in your entire system. And we all know that you know like if you max out the fan speed of a blower card, it's it's loud. Like it's not pleasant to be near. Yeah. Now this right here just absolutely dwarfs that in terms of just raw fan speed. So you can, you know, hopefully that gives you some idea of just how insanely freaking loud four of these things are when they go full tilt, right? And it also means these move a ton of air, um, which is why the vCore VRMs on this motherboard don't need a heatsink, because the whole point of a heatsink is to maximize the volume of air that you are capable of transferring your heat to, right? Like if you have a fin stack, it's basically maximizing the amount of surface area that gets in contact with the air passing over your components, which are now passing over the heatsink. But here, the air is moving so insanely fast that you don't need to bother with a heatsink, right? Um, for the for the cooling of the of the six phase vCore VRM when when you're running regular workloads. And the thing is, this six phase vCore VRM right here is real. like to, to give you some idea of just how underpowered this is compared to like consumer land 
hardware. The I, There is not a single X570 ITX motherboard that I'm aware of with a weaker VR, with a, well, yeah, with a VRM this week. <laughs> like literally the weakest X570 ITX VRM you can get, I think, no, it is is the uh, six phase with 70 amp smart power stages on the X570 ITX from Gigabyte. And that's a really strong VRM because like, th like this is weaker <laughs> and this is supposed to power a 64 core Epic, right? And so, yeah, so this is weaker than the VRM you find on ITX X570 boards. This is on par with the V-Core VRM of the B450i from MSI. This is... Uh, the same VRM that you would find on like a RX 480 Strix. This is, that's, you know, an RX 480 Strix, like RX 480, like mid-range AMD GPU. Um, this is on par with, uh, well, I'll, I, I think I'll just end there, honestly. I, I could keep pulling up examples, but th no, this is half the VRM of an MSI X570 uh, Unify or Ace. This is, uh, okay, I'm gonna stop at this point. But you get the idea. Compared to like, you know, even mid-range or high-end consumer motherboards, this right here is kind of a joke, right? Um, and the reason is because this has, like, the, the thing is in, in uh, like, most people, well, consumer motherboards run into a major, major problem with their VRM. And that is that it's jammed into like the worst area of, for airflow in the entire case. It is jammed in the top left corner. The nearest fan is several millimeters too far above it and in a pole configuration. And well, that that's kind of the end of the story, right? It's just like there's no airflow in that area. Um, especially if you're running a water if you're running a water cooling system. So those VRMs are designed to be able to handle full like insane amounts of current um, or similar amounts of current as this but without the need for any active airflow. This on the other hand needs well a ridiculous amount of airflow and uh, well yeah that that's why it's designed like it is. Um, it also means that there's very little head, like overclocking headroom on this motherboard is basically not it. Like there, there's not much. It, well, arguably not any if you're running the 64 cores. So that's kind of the thing is just like th this VRM right here. Uh, by consumer motherboard standards, this is a joke. Um, and uh, that's kind of that. You know, is is like if if you were expecting this to have some insane power delivery, uh, I mean. I don't, well, I don't know what you were expecting, but like, that's the thing is just like in servers, you build the VRM for what you need to power. And then you solve your cooling problems with 16,000 RPM fans. And then like that, you get hit rid of, you know, the need for a heatsink or anything like that. So let's talk about efficiency on this VRM. So 1.2 volts output, which is way more voltage than the, like the 64 core Epic, I would assume runs at around 0.8 volts. Um, and that's just a guess I have based on how Ryzen 3rd gen CPUs, how much power Ryzen 3rd gen CPUs pull in terms of E-Core. So I would guess these probably run on like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 volts, which is similar amount of voltage to like a GTX 480, uh, which, you know, you might be like, wait, GTX 480? Aren't those really old and built on like a 45 nanometer process? Yeah, they were just really inefficient in terms of power consumption. So NVIDIA was shipping them like super heavily undervolted at like 0 .9, 0 0.8 to 0.9 volts for the, the JF110 and the JF100. Um, GTX 590s are like 0 0.8. Uh, yeah, GTX 590s are 0 0.8. GTX 480s, I think, are 0 0.9. Um, so yeah, like, yeah, well, just to give you an idea, like, and, and then, you know, consumer uh, CPUs regularly run in excess of one volt because they don't have that many cores. Um, so yeah, anyway, 1.2 volts output, 400 kilohertz switching frequency, and uh, also if you put this, if, if you ran a 64 core Epic on 1.2 volts, this VRM is going bye-bye very, very quickly. Like, there's nothing you can do to save it from what's about to happen if you did that. Um, anyway, so 400 kilohertz, uh, 5 volts drive voltage. Um, you don't run these on any other voltage. So the efficiency would be for uh, no, 100 amps output. Nobody would run that. 180 amps output, you'd be looking at about 21 watts of heat. Uh, for comparison, you can get consumer motherboards that do 200 amps at like 16 watts of heat. Yep. It's really not that efficient. Like, it again, it's like you can get uh, mini ITX boards on X570 with more, more V-Core power delivery than this. 
Uh, 240 amps output, you're going to be looking at about 34 watts of heat. And this is, I assume, the range in which this actually runs because Epic uh, server CPUs have a 225 watt TDP. Good chunk of that goes into the SOC, um, you know, into the actual IO die, not into the cores. And as a result, you're probably going to be looking at around, you know, 180 to 200 amps going into the actual core itself, into the actual cores themselves, which is why this gets away with having no VRM heatsink because 21 watts of heat really isn't that much heat. It's just that normally, like on consumer hardware, there's no air flow here you have all of the airflow and more than you could and, and arguably too much of it um so yeah you know that's 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 the thing is like yeah this this vrm is kind of well pathetic but it doesn't need to do more um and then 300 amps output uh yeah now you need a heat sink uh yeah i'd are like at this point i'd assume you need a heat sink even with the 16 or uh 16k rpm fans the, the thing is, like, this VRM is, even at 180 amps, this VRM will be running outside of its uh, peak efficiency, as the peak efficiency for the 3555, which is a 60 amp power, uh, which I just realized I didn't mention what, what these are, but they're 60 amp power IR stages from International Rectifier, now owned by Infineon. Uh, these have hit their peak efficiency at 17.5 amps output. Um, yeah, th this, this isn't anywhere near the peak efficiency. That's 30 amps per phase. Uh, server, the, the thing is like the difference between peak efficiency and uh, like the efficiency at this point is a couple percentage points. And it's like, it's the difference between like outputting 21 watts and maybe 15 or 14 or something like that, right? And it's just like, well, that's seven watts, right? Like nobody cares. <laughs> nobody actually cares about seven watts when you can just throw this much airflow at the problem. Um, so that's the vCore del power delivery. Honestly, like, th if this was an X570 motherboard, I would just be like, this is bad. But, like, the, the thing is, like, in the context of a server motherboard, this is like, well, this makes sense, right? Like, you've got a ton of airflow. There's no point building something better because nobody's going to actually overclock their daily, like, their Epic system, um, for regular usage, um, and also, like, for all I know, this motherboard might very well, you know, like, I just, like, it's not intended use, right? So nobody's going to, like, if we saw a, you know, epic motherboard that is supposed to support overclocking, then I'd expect it to come with, like, a 16 phase or something. But this doesn't, is, isn't supposed to support overclocking, so it doesn't need that. It just needs this and then a ton of airflow, because otherwise, yeah, you'd, you'd need a heatsink at 21 watts. Like, this... This is enough heat to actually like hit over 100 degrees quite easily. Um, but uh, again, airflow, it, it's really overpowered. And in, you know, consumer systems, totally non-existent in the VRM area. So yeah, or well, there's nowhere near this much of it. Like this, this is orders of magnitude more airflow than most people have in their cases because most people consider fans that go more than 1,000 RPM very loud. Um, Though, yeah. Anyway, let's move on to the other VRMs. So this is the SOC. Uh, TRX-40 motherboards regularly have three-phase SOC power delivery. Why? Because, again, there's just no airflow in them. This right here is a two-phase. Controlled by this chip over here, which that's an IR35204. And, yeah, um, the power stages are just more 3555s. So the end result is that this can push uh, 40 amps output at four watts of heat and 60 amps output at uh, seven watts of heat. Um, and uh, yeah, compared to like TRX-40 motherboards, this is also really underpowered because a lot of TRX, like TRX, you get TRX-40 motherboards with uh, three phases of 70 amp uh, smart power stages. You get uh, three phases of 60 amp power stages. Like you don't get an SOC VRM this week because it's just like, there's no, like the thing is the SOC VRM on most, uh, uh, TRX 40 motherboards is kind of just like, it's, it's really not in a good place in terms of like cooling capabilities. And again, it's just like, you can't rely on the end user to actually have decent case airflow. So you have to design the VRM to just be, you know, cool, like completely passive at full output and still be like, still be able to not run at insane temperatures. The server motherboard, that not, not, not a concern. And the SOC VRM is of course mirrored. So you have it also here. So that's our other SOC. Um, 
Now let's take a look at the memory power delivery. Now this is where server boards absolutely dominate, like, you know, blow consumer boards away because on a consumer motherboard, like if you have a two channel memory, if you have a two channel motherboard, um, so like an X570 or a Z390 board, uh, the maximum amount of memory you can install is 128 gigabytes. Uh, on, in server land, you can get 128 gigabyte memory sticks. Yes, one memory stick with 128 gigs of RAM on it. And to make things worse, not only do you have to power all of the memory chips, you also have to power the register. So there's an extra chip on those memory sticks that basically allows the memory controller, uh, well, basically fixes the fact that with that many memory chips, the signal integrity is a disaster. So there's an extra chip that is basically a bunch of logic that connects all the memory chips to the memory controller. And that pulls a bunch of power as well. And yeah, you know, and that's, you know, you can get 128 gig sticks, you can get 256 gig sticks, and then you can put, uh, how many slots is this? This should be eight, isn't it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, you can put eight on each side of the CPU. So yeah, uh, you need power delivery that is, you know, up to the task for, for your insane amounts of RAM. And that's why you have a VDDR VRM that's a four phase. For comparison, even a lot of high-end consumer boards will have a single phase memory power delivery system because it just, like, you're just never going to pull this much power through it. But uh, yeah, it, on server boards, <laughs> very different considerations for, for the memory power delivery. Um, and of course, there's no heatsink on this either, so that doesn't really help the situation. Uh, this over here is probably the VPP rail. I'm saying probably because I'm not 100% certain. Um, but that's like, that's the only other rail that would need to be like major rail that you need for the memory that should be in this location. Um, and VPP on like consumer motherboards, like honestly, it's so small that it's hard to find on a lot of boards because it's such a low power rail. But here, uh, you just have so much bloody memory, like you have so many <laughs> memory sticks that it's just like, yeah, even, even a supporting voltage like VPP, which doesn't really need to provide a whole lot of current at all. Uh, yeah, we, we need to beef that up to a full-on power, st like 50 amp power stage. So let's get into the details of what the components are. So the controller here is a 35, uh, is a IR3584. This is a four plus one phase controller specifically designed for memory systems, as well as some older Intel voltage regulator specs. So I assume this thing has been around for ages um, because yeah, it's like VR 12.5 compliant, which I think is Haswell. Um, but yeah, like the, you don't normally see this on mo motherboards because it's just like the, the main use I assume for it is just memory power delivery. And I'm not sure what the differences in like memory power delivery specifications are. I also don't really care that much. It's probably to support the 2.5 volt VPP rail. Like that, that's normally like if you just need a different voltage range than what your normal CPUs need, like you need a new voltage regulator standard. So it's probably what it is. Anyway, so yeah, one phase VPP, that's the plus one. And then VDDR is one, two, three, four phases. And the power stages here are not more 3555s because they'd be quite excessive. Uh, no, in instead we have 3556s, which are only, well, actually, I'm not sure they'd be excessive. Well, no, they would be excessive because if they weren't excessive, they would have used them, right? It's a server board. It's like whatever is actually present on the board is just right for the task because otherwise they'd use something bigger. Um, so yeah, 3556s are 50 amp power stages. Um, and with four of them, uh, okay. And these hit peak efficiency at 15 amps output and four of them give the memory power delivery system the ability to do the following. So 1.2 volts, 400 kilohertz switching frequency and five volts drive voltage. Just again, I'm realizing this is getting quite messy. Um, but yeah, 1.2 volts output voltage, which memory sticks actually just straight up run on 1.2 volts, 400 kilohertz switching frequency and five volts drive, uh, which is just like what you'd run these on. And this is just the specified switching frequency in the data sheet. You could run them a little slower to try get more efficiency. You could run them a little higher to get more uh, regular, like better output regulation. But uh, this is a server board. Nobody cares about overclocking support. So they're probably just going to run it straight to 400 kilohertz, especially since this is a gigabyte board. Like I'd be very surprised if they were running it at anything other than 400 kilohertz. Um, so anyway, the end result is that this can push 
60 amps into the memory slots um, while producing about 7 watts of heat, so that's nothing. Um, and 100 amps while producing 12 watts of heat, so that starts getting kind of significant. And uh, 140 amps while producing 21 watts of heat. So evidently, um, I like based on the the efficiency curve here, right? Where basically going from 100 amps to 140 amps, it pretty much doubles your heat output. I would guess that. Uh, well, actually, that's kind of true for seven to 12 watts. So it's just like the the, the function, uh, the the nature of power dissipation in power stages is just that. So you know, it makes sense that that happens. But I would assume that this probably like they normally regularly deal with the memory system pulling like a hundred amps. And of course we have, you know, a VDDR and a VPP for each set of memory slots. So here's your next VDDR. Um, so, and that, that still belongs to this socket. Um, then this is VPP and this is a kind of odd layout. Um, I assume they've done this because, well, it might be that they've done this because it's just like, well, it doesn't make sense to have two separate 2.5 volt power plant, like, uh, like it doesn't make sense to have two separate two and a half volt regulators in this area. You could just combine them into one, but they could also be completely separate and just jammed next to each other for reasons I can't think, like, I can't think of a reason right now, but, um, yeah, so these are going to be VPP just because, well, you know, same, same inductor as like this VPP right there. Um, then we have more VDDR because your next set of DIMM slots. So DR. And then over here we get another set of VDDR and there's your VPP, which you can just about see the inductor. So that goes like that. And then VDDR goes like that. And that's all the same thing across the entire board. So yeah, that's that's kind of it as far as I'm concerned. Like there's a lot of other specialized server, you know, chips on, on a board like this. Um, like, oh, that's a shame they didn't like. So sometimes you can tell where the oh, no, it looks like. Yeah, so this is probably the baseboard management controller. Um, and uh, yeah, like I, I don't really care that much about server stuff. It's just like my, my one true interest is overclocking and the power delivery necessary for it. Um, and so, you know, all of the like expansion options for, for servers, like high uh, networking controllers, that kind of thing. And it's just like, eh, not interested. Um, yeah, in terms of power delivery, like, the, you know, hopeful, well, I don't know. Like I found this, like, I found this interesting cause it's like, you could technically overclock an Epic, uh, you know, 64 core. And then th this VRM goes bye-bye very, very quickly. Like, honestly, you couldn't even water block this into not going bye-bye very quickly because, like, on like at 1.2 volts output, if you're running, like, Prime 95, um, eight cores of Zen pull... Well, one core of a Zen 2 CPU on 7 nanometers should pull around 10 amps. With 64 of them, that's 640 amps. Like, the, the 64 core... Uh, if you wanted to overclock a 64 core epic, like a lot, like to four plus gigahertz all cores, I would assume you'd need a motherboard that like a, a, a power delivery system similar to what you see on the LG 3647 extreme overclocking boards, like the Dominus Extreme from Asus, as well as the Aorus Extreme from from Gigabyte, right? The both of which are like 32 power stages and Gigabyte's 32 phases. Asus is still on eight phases because they evidently haven't learned how to count past eight. <laughs> it works fine. Like, honestly, they're really good at building eight phase VRMs and low phase counts in general. And, you know, they can keep up with the performance of much higher phase counts. It's just like there's different, totally different design considerations when you're doing that. So um, anyway, but like, yeah, th this, this, this is a server, right? <laughs> so the VRM is just like, it's not designed to take insane amounts of overclocking. Um, though I think if you you know, like zip tied a heatsink to it, you might be able to just about run 300 amps output for a little bit. Maybe with a water block, you, you could actually hit the, you know, 60 amp rating of the power stages. Though funnily enough, the, 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 the thing with 60 amp rated parts is that their data sheets cut off at 55 amps most of the time. Like most power stages that are rated for 60 amps, the data sheet ends at 55 because you really shouldn't be actually trying to push 60 amps through a 60 amp part because the heat output at that point per component gets absolutely insane. And then the other consideration is like, are these inductors capable of handling 60 amps or, 
because there, there's the whole issue like your inductors might saturate and that'll just send your voltage regulation to hell or they'll just produce a ton of heat and you know well or well yeah or they'll just get really really hot and that's also no good because everything running really hot is just bad for for longevity so it's kind of the thing is like you might be able to squeeze out maybe 300 ish amps maybe 300 plus with with water cooling or with novec right if you submerged it in novec like der bauer did uh with some of the past epic servers uh, you you could probably push um, you know all all the way up to 360 amps through through that VRM, but I still don't think that would be anywhere near enough for what you would need if you could actually like if you could go to like four plus gigahertz. I I don't think uh, that would be anywhere near enough in terms of power delivery. Um, I could be wrong about that, but yeah. Just also, you'd need one hell of a, cool, a cooling system at that point on the CPUs themselves as well. So yeah, that's that's kind of the thing with. Uh, Oh, wait, I forgot to mention these. They're, well, the thing is, I can't figure out what these are. It's probably VTT DDR. It's just like I've never seen a VTT DDR impl uh, implemented this way. It's normally a linear regulator, and this looks like a bun bunch of uh, buck converters, which is kind of like, well, that's strange. But yeah, without actually having the board in hand, it makes it really hard to, to know what, for sure what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, server hardware, you know, like, I don't know, maybe some people were expecting this to be built to like some insane quality standards that you'd never see on like consumer hardware. But honestly, like if, if like your vCore VRM on your mid range X, like on your 200 on your, yeah, even $200 X570 boards, like the vCore on those um, might not necessarily built, be built with like the thing is these are built with uh it's very different considerations. So for a lot of like, uh, for for some sort like, well, the thing is, depend like sometimes you get straight up like specifications from the data center uh, of what they want on their motherboard, and they'll have requests like, you know, VRM have to, VRMs have to hit this level of efficiency. You're not allowed to use this type of capacitor. The capacitors that you do use have to be supplied by these suppliers, or you're not allowed to get them from this country or that country, or you know, you get the idea. Um, you need at least this many, actually not even at least, it's going to be like, you need this many capacitors, you need this kind of current monitoring capability, you need, like, there's basically, you get a, like, you basically, you don't have a choice when building the boards, it's just like, this is what you're gonna build, and that's what gets built, and so server hardware is just kind of like, like, yeah, and, and, you know, the spec is really well designed, but it's, and, and you know, it, fits exactly the application but you don't get the you don't get the like creativity of consumer hardware where on the high end it's just like yeah we're, we're gonna build a board with two to three times more power delivery than is ever gonna be necessary for the platform uh and you're gonna see you know all kinds of just like like unnecessary amounts of pcb layers to try get better memory compat like better memory overclocking or you know just like all, all kinds of, and the funny thing is like, there are like some, some of the really extreme, extreme overclocking boards, like go as far as like different mounting hole spacing, like the, just, you know, specs, specs are for, for boring people. It's just violate all of it. <laughs> um, and then in server land, it's just like, nah, this, this has to run. It has to be reliable and it has to not call, like it has to, you know, like there, the, the thing is the cost isn't as much of a factor though. Like ad admittedly, they won't pay two times more for the board if it has like twice, tw uh, uh, if it has like, like, you know, unnecessary things on it, but at the same time, it's not so cost sensitive where it makes sense to just, you know, cut off, uh, you know, try mess around with like, Hey, could we run a 10 amp weaker power stage, right? And save money on that. Or could we run, uh, you know, instead of having all real phases, can we do, uh, a bunch of power stages in parallel or can we do to minimize how many controllers we need or can we do you know like various sort of cost cutting type things that you see on lower end consumer boards yeah you're not going to see that in server so that's it for the video thanks for watching like share subscribe leave any comments questions suggestions down in the comment section below there's store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up some gamers nexus merch uh, and if you'd like to support us directly and don't want to buy anything, there's the Gamers Nexus Patreon. So there's links to both down down below the video. Um, and those do help out with the channel immensely. And uh, if you'd like to see more content from me, I have a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking where I do overclocking things. That's literally all the content on there is just overclocking things. So yeah, 
That's it for the video. Thanks for watching and uh, goodbye.